Hi there, so this is a video that has been a long time coming, but we really were in no mood to make it. Honestly, after so many disappointing ends to so many shows, books, and manga, we really hoped that Attack on Titan would be the exception. However, the reality is that AOT's ending is just the worst, and there are so many things that don't make sense or add up, and we honestly can't be bothered going through them all. So instead, we decided to explore the chapter where everything went wrong. Because if Isayama had gone with his original ending, Attack on Titan would have gone down as one of the greatest manga and animes of all time. But he didn't, so let's explore the chapter that ruined Attack on Titan's legacy by being the point of departure between Isayama's original ending and what we got, chapter 88. This chapter came after Erwin's epic charge against the Beast Titan, Armin's heroic sacrifice, and the twist reveal that the outside world is actually more advanced than we previously thought. This was peak AOT, and sadly, the last arc untouched by Isayama's decision to change the ending, which starts in chapter 88 with the introduction of the paths. It's obvious that Isayama's original ending didn't have the path since it had never been mentioned, or foreshadowed in any way before chapter 88. At the time, my brother and I were slightly nervous at this new development, since the paths felt like a bizarre shift from the grounded realism of the story so far into a more generic supernatural fantasy. Where it turns out everyone was connected the whole time by fate, or destiny, or some other kind of plot convenience. However, we were reassured by Kruger's line that Grisha had to make sure the same history and same mistakes were not repeated. Which, to us, meant Isayama was telling the reader, don't worry, I won't make the same mistakes other stories have made when introducing fate, or destiny, or time travel. And up until now, there was no reason to doubt Isayama wouldn't deliver a banger of an ending. You like that word, banger? We just come off the best arc of Attack on Titan, and so far, all his mysteries and twist reveals had been well set up and realistic within the world's logic. However, such a blunt and hand-fisted introduction should have raised some concerns. Now, introducing a supernatural force like the Paths into the story does not automatically mean the story was going to turn bad, because like all things, it comes down to the execution. But as we know, Eren would go on to ignore Kruger's warning and allow history to repeat itself. Only this time, it ended with Paradise's total destruction and the return of Titan powers. The paths could have been similar to when Doctor Strange used the Time Stone to see into the future and find the one outcome, where the Avengers could defeat Thanos. So during the rumbling, we assumed this is what Eren had done and all his actions would culminate in the only possible outcome where his friends could all live long and happy lives, with the Titan powers also being destroyed. But I think most people would agree that Eren achieved neither of these goals. His friends had to live in a fascist dystopia, their families forced to live in protective custody, and their children would all die screaming because Eren killed billions of people, and the remaining 20% rightfully took their revenge on Paradise Island? Eren comes off as a complete idiot, and yet the ending treats his actions like a noble sacrifice, which makes you realise that Isayama actually thinks Eren did the right thing, and exposes Isayama's moronic and depressing take on humanity. Eren's motivations and justifications are so short-sighted and dumb that you honestly regret ever liking him in the first place. So we're going to go through chapter 88 to 139 and show how every character got worse or was ruined with the exception of Levi, who had the only meaningful arc in the War for Paradise Island. This list excludes Gabby, Falco and Peek, who were all introduced after chapter 88. Instead, we'll be looking at the least ruined to most ruined characters of Attack on Titan, starting with Reiner who, even though his sniffing of Historia's letter was so weird, actually had the best character arc, which sadly isn't saying much. At the start of the Mali arc, Reiner's story is actually depressing. Being the only survivor of the mission to retake the founding Titan has him doing all he can do to redeem himself in the eyes of the Marlinian military. We get to see him foster and help raise the next generation of warrior candidates, which is sad. 
when you see how brutal his experiences were by comparison. Reiner, not being a great soldier, is a great subversion, because we would have thought the opposite to be true, and it really humanizes him. Reiner and Falco's mission to spare Gabby is also so heartfelt, because we've seen the toil it's taken on Reiner, and he doesn't want anyone who was just as brainwashed as he was to have their world shattered with the realization that the thing which gives them purpose is actually the worst thing imaginable. At least by giving it to Falco, he knows exactly what he's getting into, the same as Peek or Marcel. Next, Reiner's attempted suicide is such a great low point for him to build himself back from. Finally, that scene with Eren in the cellar is actually one of the only two great scenes from the last arc. Because from Reiner's perspective, Eren is the living embodiment of his worst nightmare. All his sins, all his regrets, rolled up into one horrifying enemy. Like, we'd love to go back and examine why the cellar scene between Reiner and Eren is so good, but the ending wrecks most of what Eren says to Reiner, so we'll move on. But yeah, Reiner is probably the only character who comes out of the War for Paradise Island arc better than when he entered it. Sadly, he's the only one, and from here on out, it's only a downward spiral. Next is Jean, who didn't really do much, but also didn't do anything that ruined his character. He was mostly the same old Jean, just with less to do, and mostly existed to forgive Eren at the end of any wrongdoing. That's all he and Connie were kept alive to do. But he had some good moments, like when On Yankapon asks why he's helping Mali. Jean replies that the bones turned to ash, Marco, would never forgive him if he didn't. His next good moment is with Connie, when they're about to be turned into titans, and they both know it. So they go out like champs, and it sucks that Isayama took this great ending away from them by bringing them both back to life so Eren could be absolved of killing them. Which is infuriating, because the idea that no one died going up against hundreds of titan shifters is just so ridiculous. Anyway, next character to be ruined is Hanji, who is revealed to be a pretty bad commander by allowing Eren and the Jaegerist to seize power and turn the entire military into mindless titans. Although the parallel of her becoming just like Sanus, who tells her the torch of oppression has now been passed onto her, was well done. However, like everyone else, she ends up getting easily played by Eren, and it does diminish her character to see her utterly unable to stop Eren and the Jaegerists. She tries to redeem herself by leading the charge to stop Eren, but her final embarrassment comes in making Armin the 15th commander of the Survey Corps. Jean was clearly the better candidate and more appropriate, considering they were on a mission to kill Armin's best friend. The next character to be ruined is Mikasa, who spends the entire war for Paradise Island pleading for Eren to come back to them, and then to top it all off with the reveal that the person Ymir was waiting for this whole time was actually Mikasa is god awful. It literally comes out of nowhere, except for a few headaches which might have been Ackerman related since Levi had headaches too. Honestly, it makes no sense that Mikasa was the one to free Ymir. When Eren had already kind of freed her in chapter 122, when Eren saw Fritz's dream, Eldia shall rule this world with its titans. Eren responds, I'm going to put an end to this world. But wait, if Ymir's a slave to Fritz until Mikasa chops off Eren's head, then shouldn't she ignore Eren here? The whole scene seems to indicate that Eren is freeing Ymir of Fritz's control, which is why she is now free of the paths. And by the way, who is sending the past Titan shifter holders against the Alliance? Because it's never made clear if it's Ymir, Eren, or the Titan Parasite. Like, this whole final battle sequence is so convoluted and dumb. Eren knows what's already going to happen, but why can't Ymir or the Titan Parasite see the future, since the power Eren is using comes, comes from, them. from them? It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, Mikasa fulfills destiny and inspires Ymir to free herself. It's pretty awful and wasn't foreshadowed at all, so let's just move on. Mikasa killing Eren would have been shocking had Eren not done so much horrible stuff to force Mikasa's hand. See, if Eren believed that a rumbling was the only way and then Mikasa killed him, that would have been bold. But as we know, everything Eren did was to convince Mikasa to kill him, making her choice to kill him 
pretty empty of emotional stake. Anyway, Ooh, the, next the next two we'll do, we'll do together. together. Connie and Annie. Yeah, they're both used for comedic relief, and honestly, Annie and Armin's love story fell flat in the backdrop of billions of people dying. Their scenes together are awkward. Like, should we be doing this now, or should we wait? Honestly, everything post-rumbling is too chaotic, and character motivations are just thrown out the window in favour of moving the plot forward. There is more we could say, but honestly, Annie was such a good and complex villain that her return feels wasted, while Connie is just there to crack jokes and remind us that his mum is a titan. He doesn't do anything besides that, except give Reiner a pep talk. Although, it was nice when he finally empathises with Reiner, after having to kill Daz and Samuel, and realise that Reiner must have felt the same way when he was betraying them. Now, we're on to the big three, the, the most, most ruined, ruined characters, characters of Attack on Title in the final stretch of the series. We'll start with the less guilty candidate, Historia, whose only crime is not doing anything because Isayama gave her nothing to do. Honestly, if there was anyone that Ymir should have looked on to inspire her, it should have been Historia, as her direct descendant. Both of them had pretty similar life stories. They both grew up unloved and forced to work for others. However, within each of them contained a streak of rebellion, and finally, they were both thrusted into positions of great power. Why Ymir chose to follow Mikasa instead is baffling, and Historia's plotline was pointless to the story and didn't add anything except explain her absence in the final arc, which, again, was a huge waste. She let Eren go through with his plan, and therefore her people all died screaming under a hail of bombs that they rightfully deserved. She only cared about her orphans, who all died like everyone else. She did and accomplished nothing. The next biggest failure is Armin, who after gaining the colossal titan power became the biggest waste of oxygen in the entire manga despite having the most destructive titan power. All his plans failed, every single one. Trying to stop Eren, failed. Trying to outsmart Flock, failed. Trying to convince the outside world to make peace, failed. He went from being the smartest character in the story and the natural successor of Erwin to being a hypocrite who cares more about Mikas' feeling than the safety and future of Paradise Island and the billions of people outside the walls. He spends the last chapter talking about Mikas' feelings and not about how Eren's plan makes no sense and will result in the outside world eventually taking revenge. Then, he has the audacity to thank Eren for being a mass murderer. He also ignores Eren's confession that he murdered his own mum and instead forgives him and holds his hand to make him feel better. The ending is like a cancer that just keeps on growing. Anyway, we're finally here. We're going to be talking about Eren and the ending as one, since you can't talk about one without the other. Eren's actions and motivations in the final arc are so stupid. We can outline Eren's reasons for doing a rumbling into three motivations. One, he wants to protect Paradise Island. Two, he wants to rid the world of Titan powers forever. Three, he wants his friends to live long and happy lives. However, we propose that Eren accomplishes none of these objectives. Not one. Let's start with the first motivation. He wants to protect Paradise. Well, as we predicted in our The End and Fall of Attack on Titan, the remaining 20% of humanity would firebomb Paradise Island out of existence. Which is exactly what happened. So, Eren failed to protect Paradise Island. Second motivation. Eren wants to rid the world of Titan powers forever. Well, as the final page indicates, it looks as though Titan powers will be coming back. Which means Eren gambled everything and everyone on a plan that he didn't know would work, which is so embarrassing. Third motivation, Eren's friends will get to live long and happy lives. But were they really happy? We can attest that each of them were morally good people who chose to join the scouts, rather than live comfortable lives inside the interior. Why? Because they couldn't enjoy easy, carefree lives inside the walls as MPs, knowing that there were other people out there paying for their happiness by dying at the hands of titans. So realistically, how would they have felt knowing their happiness was bought and paid for by billions of people who had to die horrible, horrible deaths? 
we're talking about women, children, mothers, daughters, brothers, and sisters. All crushed to death, their insides squirting out of them, their brains and hearts reduced to the sides of puddles, having to hear their loved ones die right beside them as they themselves die horrifically. Just so Aaron and his friends could be quote unquote happy. It's sickening. It's actually sickening to think about. We don't think Eren, or by extension Isayama, understands that real people couldn't be happy under those circumstances, especially when all of them risked their lives to stop Eren. Because what they thought he was doing was wrong. So to find out that Eren did the rumbling for their happiness would create too much pressure on them to be happy. How could they not think about the millions of innocent children who were crushed to death with their mother's arms wrapped around them. It's like knowing your friend, Adolf, did a holocaust, so you and your friends would all get to live long and happy lives. But he ignores the fact that one day, the rest of the world will take their revenge on your home, and maybe you won't suffer the consequences, but your children and grandchildren will. You can't ignore the parallels. Eren, and by extension, Isayama, thinks living in a fascist wet dream would be a happy life. But what happens when they get depressed? Are they allowed to be depressed? Because millions of children died screaming so they could be happy. How would that not traumatize them? How would they not drown in guilt and fear for their children? It wouldn't be a shock if some of Eren's friends committed suicide because Eren put too much pressure on them to be happy. Isayama has this idolized vision of how Eren's friends would live their lives after his sacrifice. But like Eren, he doesn't get it. They couldn't be happy after this, especially with the looming threat of war with the remaining 20% of humanity. At least, if Paradise had used the rumbling as a deterrent, the people of Paradise would be morally good, but instead they glorify Eren's actions. Isayama's view of humanity is ultra-fascist, and whatever message he was trying to convey is belittled by the complete absurdity of Eren's motivations and how his friends would have to live in fear that some Eldian fascists don't just come one day and murder their families for the crime of killing their Eren messiah. Eren has created a morally repugnant society and thinks this is the kind of world his friends would be happy to live in. Here are some final points to round out why Isayama is a terrible storyteller. Eren's rage over Historia being turned into a titan was meaningless, since he knew titans would be gone in the end. Also, Eren's answer that he doesn't know why he did any of this is something you do to avoid having to explain that what Eren is doing makes no sense. Grisha's flip-flopping by giving Eren the attack titan power means in the end he was okay with Eren killing billions, despite then coming back again to stop Eren in titan form. This again makes no sense, which is why it was left unexplained by Isayama. Ymir was built up to be someone longing for freedom, yet all her prior characterization and desire for freedom were a ruse to trick the reader in favour of a last minute twist that had no build up, and is a disgusting, perverted male fantasy that she loved her abuser this whole time. No woman would ever write this, but Isayama sure did. This reveal ruins the second great part of The War for Paradise, which was chapter 121 and 122. Since now, nothing about Ymir being a slave matters anymore. She's just following King Fritz because she's got a male slave fantasy complex. Her waiting all this time for Eren to free her has been retconned to have the person she's waiting for be Mikasa instead. Those two chapters are now meaningless. Ymir could have ended the curse herself the entire time since King Fritz had been dead. For 2000 years. Isayama even compared Eren's plan to what Karl Fritz and the Tibers did which we all know ended in failure. So, why did Eren think it would work when it goes against his belief that people need to know the truth to be free? The final two chapters set up a battle against the Hallucigenia, only for that creature to completely disappear in 139. No one even acknowledges its existence. The final battle was anticlimactic, the protagonist of the series died in the most one-sided battle ever where he was asleep for most of it. 
and hardly put up a fight in the end. Then the reveal that Eren pretty much let them win for a plan that ends up killing everyone on Paradise Island is ludicrous. Zeke killing himself is also ridiculous. Many characters express how important it is not to pass the burden of war onto the next generation, and yet this is precisely what Eren does, and because Paradise doesn't have Titan powers to protect them, they get firebombed out of existence. Eren being a slave to fate makes no sense. His free will has been a consistent part of his characterization, and we even had a chapter dedicated to how everything Eren saw of the future happens because of his own free will. That's the reason Eren felt so much guilt, but now it's revealed he had no free will. This twist also makes the revised final panel lose all impact, since it means when Grisha said, you are free, it's not true. Eren wasn't free. Also, that panel is just randomly thrown in there and feels like an afterthought he had to include. The ending has nothing impactful to say except genocide is okay. That's it. That's the message. Eren and Armin's entire conversation was so cringeworthy. Every serious topic was pushed to the side just so they could talk about Mikasa and Eren's feelings for her. Somehow, everything they discussed went back to Mikasa. It seems to be all Armin was interested in, not the fact that most of the world was going to die or that Eren killed his own mother. Everything about Eren's rant was comedic, and his newfound obsession for Mikasa coming out of nowhere made his tantrum even more cringe. The same guy who always pushed Mikasa away is now bawling his eyes out over just the idea of Mikasa ending up with another man. You couldn't make Eren look any more pathetic than this. The scene where everyone is turned back to normal and almost all the Alliance members take turns saying how great Eren is feels as though Isayama is trying to gaslight you. The last line of the entire series is Mikasa thanking a bird for wrapping the scarf around her. Even just the implication that Eren turned himself into a bird is so utterly bizarre and laughable. Something like this isn't even possible in the series. Yet, here we are. Next, Eren erasing his friends' memories goes against his belief. That the opposite of freedom is ignorance, and it shouldn't even be possible to do that in the case of Mikasa, since she's an Ackerman. Eren killing his own mother is a terrible twist. We already had a reason why Dina went to Kala, Making Eren control Dina adds absolutely nothing to the story and makes him the source of his own suffering for no reason. This twist exists for nothing other than to shock the audience by damaging Eren's character. Eren's conversation with Reiner in chapter 100 about his mother's death holds no weight anymore because now Eren was the one responsible for that and he made Reiner have a breakdown for no reason. Another huge problem is why did Ymir help out in chapter 137 and convince the other Attack Titan holders to help Armin? Wasn't she still working with Eren to bring about a rumbling, or had she changed her mind? If so, why? Armin says there is something Ymir wants. Does this mean Ymir knows that if she helps the Alliance, she'll get to see Mikasa kill Eren? And this will free her of Fritz's control? But if she knows this will happen, then doesn't her helping make it happen negate the effect it would have on her later? Why did Grisha flip-flop? Why did Eren think Armin could convince the remaining 20% not to take revenge on a defenseless paradise island? Why did the Titan Parasite disappear when Eren died? It didn't disappear when Ymir died. How did Frida not know about the Attack Titan's power of being able to look into the future? Surely, after 2,000 years, the founding Titan holder would have eventually learnt that the Attack Titan power could see into the future. How did the nine Titan powers come about? Are they pieces of Ymir's soul? Why are there nine and not more? We could keep going, but we'll stop there. Honestly, our hope and dream is that this is not Isayama's ending, and he wants to get revenge on manga readers for spoiling stories to anime watchers by creating a fake ending and giving the real ending to the anime production company. However, this makes no sense since manga readers are the ones who pay Isayama, not anime watchers. So our dream that this ending is a parody doesn't hold any weight. Honestly, Attack on Titan doesn't deserve people talking about it. It had its chance to be great and blew it, so that's that. We just want to say a quick thank you to everyone who liked and subscribed to our videos. We probably should have given you this final review earlier, but we knew this would be our last video on Attack on Titan. 
so we didn't really want to rush it. It's been fun making theories that ultimately went nowhere, and we'll continue to keep on doing it. So if you're interested in getting into a song of ice and fire, we're making a video series that might be of interest to you. We'll also try and cover other series and make more theory prediction videos about stories that actually reward fans for paying attention instead of punishing them. Anyway, that's about it. Thank you for watching until the end. Goodbye.